title of my research project is, as you can see on the screen, does I do include God? This question was based on the, or this title was based on my overall research question, was what are the experiences of the United Church clergy when officiating weddings that are not explicitly Christian? In other words, when a minister gets somebody coming to them and say, we would like to, you to officiate our wedding, but we don't want any God talk. Early in my ministry, I, I sought the counsel of my educational supervisor who had shared his position with me on officiating at such weddings. My position became much like his. I'm a minister, and therefore the ceremony will have some explicit Christianity points in it. Now, my stance had a sort of a broad scope, and my minimum requirement was at least a prayer and a scriptural passage must be included in the ceremony. My interest in this particular topic came as a result of when I was asked to officiate two weddings this past summer. One was for a deaf couple, and the importance of that for some of you who may know me is because not only am I a sign language interpreter by the other hat that I wear, but I'm also the son of deaf parents. The second wedding was for my goddaughter, who had originally asked if I would interpret her wedding and then that resulted in her changing her mind and saying, no, actually, we would like you to officiate this way. Now, both of them came to me and said that they didn't want uh, a Christian wedding. They wanted the omission of the Christian language from the service. So I sat down and it sort of caused me to revisit my ponderings of four years ago where I had my original stance and now being asked to preside or officiate at two weddings that were of significant importance to me. And I also started to realize that there was an increase in what we've all been hearing uh, around, bantered around the SBNR, spiritual but not religious population. And I thought that maybe as a United Church clergy, I would see an increase of weddings or requests to do weddings because of that very thing. We're spiritual, but not we're religious, and so we're going to come to you and ask you to do our way. I'm hoping that the benefits of this research will be to inform the United Church of Canada broadly, current clergy and theological students as to the practice of what is being done in our church context. And that hopefully the data may allow the church to identify and respond to this phenomenon of a, a population segment that's identifying, as I said, spiritual but not religious. And in fact, in, in talking with Tim this morning, he had shared that the Ontario government apparently has just changed the regulations around who are, they are granting licenses to, and they are eliminating, from my understanding of talking to Tim, the whole wedding officiant unless you have an affiliation with a religious organization, you're a justice of the peace or, or things like that. They are getting rid of that. So we as clergy are probably gonna see an increase in these. So I wanted to explore the, the United Church clergy's experience. I'm required by the outline of my project is to do it in a form of qualitative which means basically I'm going to gather data from interviews that I do. My partners would then share, my research partners who I interviewed would share their experiences when asked to officiate these weddings without God talk. I would conduct a series of interviews that I hope would see a theme emerging from the data that I collected. And this is the basis of my methodology. Once I start to get that data, then I would look for what's called grounded theory, a theory that would come out of those themes that I would start to identify. And hopefully this, what, what this would do would have a focus or specificity on the current practice of clergy and may inform the future practice of clergy in the church. Another quality of grounded theory is that the research may be used to frame 
future research on a related topic, such as why couples choose clergy to officiate when they do identify as spiritual but not religious. I had to do a full research uh, ethics proposal to the ethics board at AST, and when they uh, approved it, they also approved a two-pronged approach for me. The first one would be to launch an online survey. And the survey consisted of seven type questions asking for providence or a, a, a providence of uh, residence, residency, whether they were ordained, diaconal, DLM, or student, how many years in ministry, number of weddings officiated, whether or not they had been asked to officiate a wedding in the area that I was researching, and if they did, did they officiate it? And then I gave them an opportunity to fill in some comments. Um, at the end of that interview, I extended an invitation for all of those who responded to the online survey to contact me independently to be further interviewed. I would conduct a series of interviews that I hoped would see a theme emerging from the data, and that's what ended up coming out of this thing. I ended up seeing several themes which will be the basis of my of my data that I'm going to share with you in a few moments. The second phase of my interview or my, my research was to conduct the formal interviews. My goal was to try to interview six to eight, and in the end I ended up interviewing seven. And to keep the process somewhat light, I offered each of my research partners, the ones that I interviewed, the opportunity to give themselves a name because I am not to refer to them in their true identity. So I got names like, well, I did. Puddle, Kitten, Minerva, Gordy, Gordy Boy, William, Sunshine, and Peppy were the names that they chose. I want to take a few minutes just to re, uh, situate the research in the context of a historical point of view. Within the United Church, we have long had a standing of being at the forefront of marriage and the issues that are involved with that. But marriage was not really considered to be a Christian institution. Generally, weddings took place at the front door of the church and never actually in the church around the 10th century. And it was in the 11th century that there was a shift towards a solemnization of weddings, recognizing that it was the couple who actually made the marriage, not the church. Martin Luther stated, marriages were blessed by God, and he maintained that it was a secular association. And Calvin believed marriage was to take place in the midst of community. Here's an interesting piece of information regarding marriages in Canada. Clergy did not always have the right to officiate marriages. In fact, it was strongly argued that broadening the definition would diminish the value of marriage. Anglican priests in Canada were given the right to officiate in 1793, Congregationalists in 1829, and in 1857, all ministers were given the right to officiate weddings. In the history of the United Church, We've examined the issue of marriage since 1960 when we talked about divorce and marriage, 1988 when we talked about human sexuality, and 2003 when we drafted a, uh, a paper on same-sex marriage. Little work has been done since on the whole issue of marriage in a cultural culture of people who identify themselves as spiritual but not religious. In the 2005 document, A Marriage, Marriage, a United Church Understanding, it characterizes the celebration of marriage and worship. It says, God is praised as the source of love and initiator of covenant. Gospel values of love, justice, and compassion made to up, known to us in Jesus are expressed. Scripture is read and proclaimed in some form. Witness in the legal sense are acknowledged as well as the presence and support of family guests and congregation. 
in that document, it states that we as a denomination believe that our faith and our understanding and nature, in the nature and purpose of marriage, is grounded in Scripture. As much as Scripture is that foundation, we believe that God creates relationships and calls us into relationship. God's very nature is communal and relational, creating for us relationships and community. A covenantal relationship begins with God's love for us and God's desire to be in relationship with us. Marriage is a union in which the covenant of relationship can be expressed and mutually experienced. Marriage for Christians is a covenant made before and with God. God is a participant in that covenant. In the Marriage of the United Church document, we offer this statement. The crucial question for the church is not what marriage is or has been in society, but what it ought to be. And just before I delve into the data, I, I want to keep one thing in the forefront that I drew from this document in 2005. It says, in Canada today, marriage is one of the most prominent ways in which two people's love and commitment to each other are recognized and affirmed. And in whatever form it takes, it is an expression of culture. Culture in which it exists. So, my online survey, I had 100 respondents to the survey, which was well over what I had hoped. My goal was to try to find somewhere between 30 and 40, so I was really uh, quite pleased with the 100. 87% were ordained, 4 were diagonal, 7 were designated lay ministers, and 2% of those respondents were students. Years in ministry, there are 20% were somewhere between 0 and 5, 18% had 10, between 6 and 10 years experience, 11 and 20 had 35% of the group, and over 20, 36% of those that responded. The numbers of weddings that were officiated, uh, 20 or less, were just under half at 42%. Between 20 and 50 were at 22, and 50 or more at 36%. Here's where it gets interesting for me. When asked if they were asked to officiate at a wedding, 73% of them said, yes, I had been asked. And 27% had said, no. But when asked did they officiate at the wedding, this is the piece that sort of surprises me. 61.5% of them said, yeah, I ended up officiating at those weddings. That equaled out to about 59 responses, and 30% said no. That's about 29 responses. So 88 and a half or 85, 88 and a half percent or 85 people who responded to the question if they officiated opted to offer some comments in that comment box. Now it was only limited to about eight lines so they really couldn't go into too much depth, but it really did give me a good sense of, of sort of some themes that had happened. But that 61.5 percent was where my I was really surprised. I sort of started, I tried not to anticipate what I would expect because that would defeat the purpose, but I kind of expected that maybe when clergy were asked, hey, will you officiate my wedding but I don't want any God talk, I kind of anticipated the answer would be a flat out no. I really kind of anticipated that. Now, I want you to keep in mind that of the seven people that I interviewed, all of them also responded to this online survey, but I have no idea how they responded to the survey at all. The only thing that I asked them was, how many years of, in ministry had they served? But I didn't want to review how they responded. And when I analyzed the survey results and the interview data, 
themes began to emerge, and my interviews also confirmed what I was seeing in the online surveys. This word doodle represents some of the responses to one particular theme that I identified. And I identified it to, to the topic or the theme of relationship. And that's the relationship between the clergy person and the, per the requesting couple. And for the seven research partners and the survey respondents, it became a thing about sitting down and actually talking to the couples, developing an open line of communication and by building that sense of trust. I mean, I had some comments from the online survey to say, engage in further conversation by building trust. Their reasoning felt authentic. That one was when the minister was honest with the couple and said, you know what, I'm a United Church clergy, so I come with God. They went away for a week and came back and said, you know what, we liked your integrity, and that's the kind of person we want to officiate our wedding. Talking about what they do want and what may have meaning for that couple. Talked about what the language might sound like. Planned a ceremony that had meaning to them. An invitation to experience the church. Create something that embraced the couple's feeling of spirit. God language, they ended up liking. Without work, uh, work without pushing religion into them. Honor and respect in having that conversation. The use of the higher power kind of language and however you understand it. So these are some of the comments that generated from the online survey. Gordy Boy said that he worked collaboratively with the couple and they appreciated his level of integrity and that they wanted that to be a part of the wedding. He says, to me, it's about relationship and authenticity. And for Sunshine, trust was an important part to develop in her relationship with the couple over several meetings. Relationship is a key thing in all that I do. A sense of honor for Sunshine that she was not serving as a simple functionary. Peppy believes that couples ought to be happy. After all, it is their day. But for Pepe, one needs to be authentic to one's own beliefs and role in the church. Puddle, interesting name, believes it is important to share your views of a sacred wedding with a couple as you begin that conversation. And the first meeting or two is about establishing a relationship. And for me, this provided great insight, allowing me to understand that for many clergy, it was not about responding to those requests without a flat out no, but it was about engaging in conversation and relationship building. And to me, this is sort of the foundation to the theory that I am developing or have developed as a result of this research. A second theme that uh, emerged is something that I want to call authority and identity. Many comments acknowledge that we as clergy are granted our license to marry, though from the state, the government, but it's actually because of our role in the church. Survey comments can be summarized by, I think, in this one quote, my authority to perform the ceremony as a Christian minister, that's where the authority comes from. And as clergy, we are in a covenanted relationship with our pastoral charge. It's a function of our office. It's a part of our call to ministry. I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are a package deal. I am neither competent nor called to lead a non-Christian ceremony. But I also have to speak to some of the other comments that were like, we are just simply government agents. And marrying on, in Ontario doesn't require specific language. And I'm acting merely as a civil servant. 
were only two or three of the comments that out of the 80 some odd that I got online. William, my research partner, says, I am a Christian minister licensed to perform marriages through my denomination, authorizing me to do these weddings. William shared that as, a, as the pronouncement was made at the wedding, would say, I pronounce you by the authority granted to me through Jesus Christ in the United Church of Canada and by the laws of whatever marriage act you happen to be authorized from. Puddle says, uh, that, and, and others acknowledge the legal requirements in officiating weddings, saying, I do wedding ceremonies on behalf of the province, but yet I recognize your marriage license is connected to your appointment or your call. Pepe shared this, I bring God. I am the God bringer, and God is a part of my job. The hope that is attached to that part of what I do. Minerva shared that doing a non-Christian wedding wouldn't have been authentic for me. It would have been in the style of a wedding commissioner, especially when I am licensed as clergy. And lastly, Sunshine offers this. I'm there and God is with me. Whether I use a lot or a little bit of language, so God is coming with me. Sunshine shared that a, a couple ought not ask a minister of the United Church or any other denomination to deny who they are just so they can get married. A third and final theme I wish to speak to was that I, something that I called content content of the ceremony. I did ask a separate question um, with each of the interviewees about what their must have, what sort of was the bar that they set for it to be a Christian wedding. And I'm gonna offer you some of their, their thoughts. But from the online survey, it said, prayer, godlike language, creator, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, Love were acceptable language uses. They were open to a, a, a sense of sacredness and spiritual language. Being open to spiritual content is what they said. Articulate a, a language of diversity, inclusivity, welcome, and of course, love. And that was in uppercase. Sacredness of the union. Using other language to talk about God's presence not churchy, but still was spirit-filled. The use of rituals and language that embraced the couple's feelings of spirit. The service was spiritual and rooted in deep love. The use of creator language. The service wasn't devoid of meaning, but had spirituality and love. Somebody mentioned even the song of our, our Song of Faith, our most recent document, as a basis for using language from that for the wedding ceremony. Though it wasn't explicitly Christian, it was implicitly spiritual. And finally, the couple hungered for a spiritual experience that a, a marriage commissioner could not provide them. Now my inter interview partners, said this, Kitty, anything that is representative of, of your relationship that makes it good, healthy, and life-giving is welcomed in my ceremony. Couples tend to choose a prayer that shows the love that the couple has for the people in, the, in attendance and the world around them. They wanted to show that they, they cared for something beyond just the, the two of them. Their love is bigger than just the two. William, not going to be a Bible thumping person or me preaching at you during a ceremony, and I often find ways at the beginning of the service to introduce myself and affiliate myself with the pastoral charge to which I am called. Now you have to keep in mind that we're talking primarily weddings that don't always happen in a church building. 
I mean, very seldom were we doing weddings in churches and we're doing weddings outside of the building. So it wouldn't be implied that we are a minister. Minerva, couples have come having a strong sense of spiritual connection. Couples are open to having a wedding that honors the fact that it is not just about them. Minerva recognizes that praising God as the, the source of love is a part of a wedding ceremony, which is a worship service. And Pepe says, if we don't do it, who is? Take the opportunity to plant little seeds. However you want to say God, she says, God has a lot of names and faces. Yeah, that's me. That's my wife. Uh, Tim was there. He's had to take a phone call. I think back to my wedding two and a half years ago. <clears throat> Many of our guests had this notion that it was going to be, quote unquote, a religious wedding. Well, you were there too, weren't you? Yeah. And of course, um, it would be. I mean, after all, they thought, well, Phil's a minister. Oh, his best man is a minister. Oh, and there is a minister officiating the wedding. So why wouldn't it be religious? But many of the comments we got after the wedding were, had this element of, of surprise. They, you see, it wasn't as religious for them as what they had thought it would be. But I can tell you beyond a doubt that it was a spiritual wedding. God was certainly present and acknowledged. Right here? Yeah, he's not in the city. Yeah. And I offer that as a backdrop to what I believe is, is, the, is hidden within this battle. A reading between the lines, if you will. So as I started to analyze this then, I began to realize that there are probably two misconceptions happening. Misconception number one is that couples come in to meet a minister and have their own image of what a wedding day ought to be. And then they throw in and go, well, we also have a preconceived notion of what a Christian wedding ceremony is. And these two particular images for these couples are at a crossroads and don't match. But these couples are, as I have said before, a part of this growing population that identify them as spiritual but not religious. Once the relationship has been established and a conversation happens with the clergy, and they've started to talk about language, content, intent around what a Christian wedding is, then the couple start to go, wow, I can relate to that. It is not as religious as what I thought it was before I met with you. It falls in line with my spirituality and my beliefs. Though I offer this as my insight, I do see a great opportunity for another research project for any of those fellow students of mine who are tuning in remotely, that you may want to research why couples who came to a clergy person and said, we don't want God talk, ended up going with the minister. Because I think that would do a lot to feed this church of ours in this growing recognition of the SBNR group. Until you break through the stereotypes or the misconceptions to show folks, no, the minister isn't the minister that you thought you heard 10 years ago is something that Sunshine offered in her interview. Misconception number two, clergy. Perhaps this might even be a topic for a second reason or a third research, I don't know. What does spiritual but not religious mean to us clergy folk? When we are asked to officiate a wedding without God, are we quick to respond and decline because of our identity? are representing the denomination in our pastoral charge? Are we getting stuck on that term of spiritual and what it might mean to that growing population? In the end, the data shows that the clergy felt God was present 
and acknowledged in a way that met their own personal approach and met each couple's goal of being spiritual, but as they say, not religious. When I asked the research partners for advice that they could offer to us, students particularly, about what they may have to consider when they come to facing this kind of situation, it was clear that you are going to be faced to do this debate at some point through your ministry. So advice like check with your pastoral charge and their wedding policy. This will help you determine how you want to approach this sort of request. William summarized this by saying, and I think very well, you're not the Lone Ranger. Don't go do it yourself. There is a governing body that has said what, it's, what they expect their ministers will do as a bare minimum in a service. Minerva says, get a feel for what the congregation's understanding is and be open. Sometimes you might even be surprised. And then she says, pray and discern a lot. William also offered this. He says, show the couples love. Show them Christ. And when you do that, very rarely will they balk at the God stuff because they see love and Christ. Kitty says, I am loyal to the United Church and its policies. I believe that God works through me and allows me to discern those boundaries showing God's love. That's my approach. And she says, the minimum is in my head and in my heart. I listen for where it speaks. And so my suggestion to you would be to listen to where it speaks to you and to the community that have gathered about love. Never lose sight that people can come into church and can come into contact with the church in a way that is life-giving. And all people are a beloved child of God. Pavel says, talk this over with others. Listen to mentors and ministry, but also check against your own ego. God is present in a way that we are to be with people. So seek ways for your church and your ministry and how they can be a blessing to the community and around it. Listen to the spirit within. And if you can say with integrity and feel really positive about it, do it. And finally, we no longer can expect people to conform to who we are as a church. A trained educational supervisor, Gordy Boy, says, and just know, be okay with the fact that you can say no. Sunshine says, honor what you do and who you are on your faith journey. Temper what you do with the idea that it's not just my way. This is about being one on one with people. Just a couple more minutes and we'll open up for some questions. As I come to the end of my MDiv program, I've realized that my education has had its limitations. I mean, there are only so many things that could be covered that will prepare a student for ministry. It would be my hope that this research can equip future students and perhaps offer theological schools a glimpse into the current practices of those already in ministry. The reality for students is that we need resources to be a part of our formation. I mean, we have our academic resources, and we have programming, at least at AST, that's called the Supervised Ministry Practicum, and the resources there. We have our educational supervisors as a resource. But I am hoping that this research can assist students with their formation. I believe that the unique quality that the United Church of Canada has is that ministers and everybody that calls United Church of Canada home can fit into what I will call the spectrum of either being very liberal or being very conservative and everywhere in between. And I don't think for a moment that anybody in, that I interviewed would be either a strong conservative or a strong liberal. They fell within that spectrum, definitely. My United Church professor of worship, 
Reverend Dr. Andy O'Neill offered some thoughts on my research. And he recalled a professor of his that was, was speaking to churches being entry points. And as a denomination, we have considered marriage as an issue to be addressed, clearly. We've done it three times in our history. But I ponder if the United Church hasn't actually considered marriage as an entry point. For me, the implication for the United Church is that we have tried to be on the forefront of shifts within the Canadian cultural landscape. If we are to find ways to engage with a, a growing population of people who identify themselves as spiritual but not religious, who may not realize that there is as much common ground between where they are and where we are as a denomination? As one survey comment offered, unchurched people's understandings of what Christian or Christianity means is very inaccurate. I believe that we need to be a little more like Jesus, showing God's love to those who may be on the fringes of our church world. We are called to share the love of God in its non-judgmental form and to meet people where they are in their lives. And Kitty offered this. I believe that God works through us in amazing ways that I can't begin to describe. So the data for me shows that the clergy must understand, or sorry, uh, the data shows that most clergy understand the need for God language. That's very clear. But they also acknowledge that that may take a different form depending on how comfortable they are and the couples are. Enter into a, re a relationship, have a conversation with the people, I think are very vital to how we may become an entry point for these couples looking for a wedding officiant.